Hey everybody, it's Dr. Peebler again. It's another beautiful day here in South Florida. Finally, the rain stopped and the thunderstorm stopped. So I wanted to shoot this video outside while getting some natural light. So today we're gonna to take a detour from kind of the pathology of how cancer actually initiates through different mechanisms and to talk about thymine. So thymine is a, another name for B1, one of the B vitamins, and it is an important cofactor for PDH or pyruvate dehydrogenase. As a matter of fact, this graph here on the right shows the entire Krebs cycle, all its respective enzymes, and in the green bubbles, you actually have all the cofactors that are necessary for those enzymes to function properly. And then the red bubbles would be things that actually inhibit those enzymes from working properly. So this paper is talking about how hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha upregulation in gene expression is induced by a deficiency in thymine or B1 deficiency. So what this is saying is it is well established that thymine deficiency results in an excess of metabolic intermediates such as lactate and pyruvate, which is likely due to insufficient levels of a cofactor for the function of thymine-dependent enzymes. When in excess, both pyruvate and lactate can increase the stabilization of hypoxia-inducible factor alpha transcription factor, resulting in the transactivation of HIF one alpha regulated genes independent of low oxygen, termed pseudohypoxia. So now we've talked about succinate, we've talked about lactate, we've talked about excess glucose, all causing pseudohypoxia. This paper is giving us additional insight. So basically, any of these cofactors that are related to this enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, magnesium, B1, B2, B3, B5, and lipoic acid, all can lead to pseudohypoxia as well as excess pyruvate. So when pyruvate tends to build, up because this enzyme is not working. It can't get converted to acetyl-CoA to be used inside the mitochondria, the TCA cycle, and subsequently the electron transport chain. We're able to activate HIF, which then can lead us down the dark path of the Warburg effect. So this is another paper saying that modern thymine deficiency, and what it's saying is an average diet, even a poor one, it is not difficult to meet the daily requirements, and yet measurable thymine deficiency has been observed across multiple patient populations with incidence rates ranging from 20 to over 90 percent, depending on the study. This suggests that the RDA requirements may be insufficient to meet demands for modern living. An insufficient thymine deranges the mitochondrial respiration, inducing what has been termed pseudohypoxia. Pseudohypoxia stabilizes HIF proteins which in turn elicit a range of reactions while necessary to increase oxygenation acutely become problematic when activated chronically. The issue is not HIF when it's needed and when we're actually hypoxic. However, when we're not hypoxic and it's a chronic pseudo hypoxia that leads to damage of mitochondria, inactivation of mitochondria, and conversion to the Warburg effect. In contrast to ischemic hypoxia with pseudo hypoxia, although there is sufficient oxygen, the mitochondria are unable to utilize it effectively. This forces a shift towards anaerobic metabolism and significantly reduce energy output. Here, only two ATP molecules are synthesized compared to 38 molecules produced via OxFOS or oxidase phosphorylation pathway. Inadequate ATP output further impairs oxidative capacity, initiating a range of deleterious cascades that increase vascular reactivity, inflammation, cell apoptosis, ultimately leading to organ dysfunction or failure when sufficiently severe and chronic. So we are seeing that thymine deficiency can cause pseudohypoxia, which leads to a proclivity for anaerobic metabolism and the Warburg effect to start to materialize through HIF activation. What happens if we give thymine to people who have cancer already, though? Well, these papers actually talk about it. So we will talk in depth about a chemical compound called dichloroacetate and how it's used in metabolic therapies for cancer treatment. However, it's interesting because high dose vitamin B1 reduces proliferation or growth in cancer cell lines very similar to dichloroacetate. And what it's saying is both thymine and DCA reduce the extent of PDH phosphorylation, reduce glucose consumption, lactate production, and mitochondrial membrane potential. High dose thymine and DCA did not increase ROS, but in increased caspase 3 activity. And just in case you don't know what caspases are, they are basically what is responsible for programmed cell death or apoptosis. And our findings suggest that high dose thymines reduces cancer cell growth and proliferation by a mechanism similar to that described of dichloroacetate. And we'll talk about dichloroacetate in the future, but essentially what it does is, is it inactivates pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which is putting the brakes on pyruvate de dehydrogenase, the enzyme that requires B1. So not only does it fix the pseudohypoxia that is associated with 
the deficiency of thymine, but it also acts just like dichloroacetate as that it actually inactivates further pseudohypoxia due to being able to deactivate pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which is, this gets a little bit confusing without a picture, but it's, it's inactivating PDH. And so whether or not you're deficient in B1 or not, B1 can be an effective tool in our arsenal when using metabolic approaches to cancer. And this is just another paper highlighting a very similar thing. This is talking about, in particular, breast cancer. The mechanisms of this relationship with identified the measurement of enzymatic activity and metabolic changes results. A high dose of thymine reduced cell proliferation for breast cancer cells, a 63% decrease, but didn't affect apoptosis and the cell cycle profile. Thymine had a number of effects, reduced extracellular lactate levels in growth media, increased cellular pyruvate dehydrogenase activities and the baseline and maximum cellular oxygen consumption rate decrease non-glycotic acidification, glycolysis, and glycolytic capacity. So basically what thymine is doing, as well as dichloroacetate, which we'll talk about in the future, like I said, is essentially it's putting the brakes on the Warburg effect and it's part of a larger strategy, a multiple pronged approach at actually what they call metabolic reprogramming. We're basically taking the normal programming of bioenergetics of the cell that's been reprogrammed to the Warburg effect. And what we're doing is we're actually trying to reprogram it back to normal physiology. And that is seemingly possible through metabolic therapy in combination with some of these medications. So I hope this is a pretty cool video. I'm going to have many videos like this in the future. I wanted to just take a break from a lot of the heavy physiology to talk at least about something, a simple B vitamin and how powerful it can be for the metabolic approach to cancer. If you like videos like this, if you could just like it, subscribe, share it with friends or family. If you know anybody who's struggling with cancer, these videos could be life-saving. Or other people in the in the space, point them to Thomas Seafried, Dr. Seafried, point them to Jack Cruz, point them to people who are mitochondrial focused because that is the gold mine for this. That is where the money is at when it comes to disease, but especially cancer. Until next time.